Okay, good. For Lent, I followed the common lectionary, which is a uh, three-year cycle of scripture texts for each Sunday out of the year. Uh, and particularly at Lent and Advent, I like to follow those because they touch with the church calendar. And some Sundays they give you Bible texts that don't have a whole lot that you can pull out. Today is one just the opposite. We got some of the best texts of all. Uh, and the Old Testament text is Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17, <coughs> better known as the Ten Commandments. This is something we all need to be reminded of and something we all need to share together. Shared it with our uh, youth in Sunday school this morning, so they are already up on it. Aja and Megan uh, already know all about this. But this is one that I think it would be good for us to read together uh, because these are the basic parameters uh, of the spiritual life. And uh, it begins with the word of grace, God's saving action, and that's why God can ask uh, for our obedience in return because he has first acted to save us. In the Old Testament, it was delivery from bondage and slavery in Egypt. In the New Testament, it's delivery from bondage to sin through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's join together in this reading of God's Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guilty who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant or maidservant nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land and the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here is our reading from God's Old Testament word. May God bless it to our understanding this morning. And our New Testament reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 27. So flip over to the New Testament. And now that you've done the Ten Commandments, when somebody asks you, when was the last time you pulled out the Bible and read the Ten Commandments? You say, March 8th. We did it there all together. So it's a good thing to be reminded of. Now John's version of the cleansing of the temple is different than the other Gospels. In John's Gospel, it happens in chapter 2 at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And this was uh, Jesus' way of getting the attention of the religious leaders of his day that he has come to be a new reformer. In the other three Gospels, it happens during Holy Week at the end of his ministry. And what that tells us is Jesus probably cleansed the temple at least two times. Maybe more than that. So if you want to know why Jesus got into trouble, it's doing things like this. Uh, but this is the one that happened early uh, in uh, his ministry and brought attention to him. Uh, and uh, so let's start, uh, let's actually start with, uh, uh, yeah, verse 13. Listen now to the word of God. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found <coughs> men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. 
So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove that you have the, your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will rise, raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple uh, he, uh, he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture in the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now Lent is a season to reflect on our spiritual lives. It's kind of spiritual checkup time. To see where we are in our walk with the Lord. How are we doing? What kind of spiritual shape are we in? And it's meant to be a time to get together uh, our hearts and minds so we really appreciate Easter Sunday when the glory of the resurrection and new life burst forth. Of course, for us at this time, every Sunday is really Easter Sunday. As believers in Jesus, we always celebrate good news and resurrection. But it's also a time uh, this season that we can really focus down and, as Gina mentioned, do some cleansing inwardly and outwardly in our lives. Last week we asked the question, if you were arrested and put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence there to convict you? Not circumstantial evidence, but real evidence that you have been a follower of Jesus in your life, and not somebody who just dabbled here and there. That's a good question to reflect on. Today's question, this week's question coming out of these two passages is, what is your level of zeal for God? Are you doing what you can as a follower of Jesus and as a child of God blessed with his love and his grace and his mercy? And I'm asking this question within reason. I'm not talking about going to the far ends of the earth with this question or doing anything to alter the course of history, but just how can you change your own little sphere of influence? Are you doing all that you can where you are right now as a parent or a child or in school or at work or at home or on the job or in the community, wherever you may go here, in southern Harnett County or northern uh, Cumberland County, wherever you may live. How's your zeal? Are you doing what you can for the Lord? And our passages today give us really two ways to measure our spiritual lives. First of all is the Ten Commandments. It's good to read that and be reminded of that together. That's always a great passage to share in church. And that's really the basics of the spiritual life. They were given 3,000 plus years ago, and they still hold very true and good today. These are the 10 non-negotiable basic rules everyone should keep if we are really people of faith. Now, the world resists many of these, but these are what we hold to as God's people. And we read through there, and you can really break them into five categories. First one is no idolatry. Don't worship anything less than God and put it in the place of your creator in your life. Whether it's a statue that you bow down before like the pagan nations did before or the fame and glory and glitz and glamour that this world offers, that's not where we put our allegiance. We put it in the creator, the invisible creator, the spirit who made heavens and the earth, not lesser things. Flowing out of that is the second little category, regular worship. We honor God by keeping the Sabbath and by honoring his name. We don't use his name in a vain or empty way. Certainly don't put cuss words with it. But we also don't use religion as a magic talisman. Say, well, if I follow Jesus, then I will never have a problem in my life. How many of y'all follow Jesus and find your life is still full of problems? Jesus is the resource to get through those problems, not to prevent the problems. He doesn't put you in a, a terrarium where you live where there's no harm that can come to you. 
No, you're in the real world dealing with real life and death issues, and he's there. But what we do do with God is we come to God on a weekly basis. Every seven days, our creator has an appointment where we can meet with him here in his house. It's for our benefit. He doesn't need it. We need him. And so he offers his grace, his mercy. It's not that he's not available at other times, but at one time in the week, we all need to gather here together as his people and celebrate his name. The third category is preserve family. Honor your father and your mother. Don't commit adultery. Honor your spouse at the same time. Uh, you, you put these together. Now, kids, does that mean you like everything your mother and your father tell you? Adult kids, do you still like everything your mother and your father tell you? No, that still continues on in life altogether. But we still honor each other and work through these things, and we respect the chain of authority that God has placed in the family system. And the whole point there was, back in the ancient times, they didn't have government care or nursing homes or social security or anything. So it was up to kids to take care of their parents as they got older, and that demonstrated for the next generation of kids to come along and take care of their parents. If you don't take care of your parents, your kids won't take care of you. And uh, that's why it talks about living long in the land. It was their way of preserving life and honoring uh, everybody along the way. Fourth category is live morally. Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Uh, all those kinds of things. The basic parameters of getting along and making society civil. And then finally, we respect our neighbor. Uh, we don't lie or bear false testimony against our neighbor, and we don't covet, get jealous over what they have, and want to steal it and make it our own. Five basic categories. Now, are those popular today? In society in general? Is everybody worshiping the Lord? Is everybody honoring his name? Is anybody, everybody honoring families or marriage vows? Are they telling the truth at all levels? No, a lot of this is missing today. And what is our, happening to our society because of it? Are we getting any better? No, uh, everything's very, very scary these days. Uh, and uh, we're trying to do this. Which is the hardest of these for us to carry out as a church family? What's that? Ministering to each other. Well, that's the whole point of this is we work together. Uh, sometimes just doing the routine of that regular worship routine of honoring the Lord uh, on a regular basis is sometimes the hardest thing. The easiest one of all is sometimes the most difficult for us to do. But we need to do that. <coughs> so we have our weekly goal to have 100 in here. We did make it today, but we need to pull forward. Obviously, the weather has held us up some this year. In fact, last week we put some statistics for last year and the start of this year out there. And uh, they're available in the narthex if you didn't see them last week. Uh, and uh, last year we've been much stronger. We need to get this up for this year. And uh, particularly now that weather's getting better, we should be able to do so. Uh, ice and snow are not fun for anybody to get out early in the morning on. So we recognize that. Well, that's the first thing, that uh, passage of scripture that we can use to measure our lives by. You can just lay those out, Ten Commandments, Five basic categories, how well are we doing? That's something you can go before your God on your own and ask and uh, uh, examine yourself with. Now in the New Testament passage we read, this is another example of what's our zeal for the Lord. And here we're talking about following the example of Jesus. And this story was the first cleansing of the temple. And as I mentioned, Jesus probably did it at least twice. He may have even done it more times, which uh, if you want to know why Jesus got into trouble, uh, that's that what happens along the way. In fact, this week I've been reading this book, which I recommend. It's a good book for Lent, Killing Jesus, uh, Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard. Uh, it's very simple, well written. The only confusing part is how to tell Caesar Augustus from C Julius Caesar from Caesar Tiberius and all those other guys, but they were all reprehensible, and they set the pattern for killing good people in the world, and they uh, is set, set up what happened, and the Jewish kings were just as bad, and so when Jesus challenged them, 
uh, it all happened. But this is where Jesus stood up for what was right in the eyes of God rather than what was right in the eyes of man or even the religious leaders of his day. And one of the things behind this story is sometimes the religious authorities need to do some cleansing and church and religious systems can become corrupt. Uh, yesterday, Donna Hanning and I and Ronnie uh, 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 were at a presbytery meeting uh, where we voted on redefining marriage. Uh, fortunately, our presbytery voted against that motion, uh, and uh, it was 120 voted in favor of the change, 171 voted against, so it failed in Coastal Carolina Presbytery, but it's probably going to pass overall nationally, and for us uh, as a traditional value church, that's greatly distressing, and it's why we are looking at a different denominational affiliation, a different Presbyterian group to, to merge with at this particular point in time. But see, even church systems can become corrupt. Sometimes people dealing with the holy things of God miss the point. And uh, Jesus had to go in and show them the way. And the thing that you can see about the life of Jesus is there's never compromise there. There's grace, there's mercy, but there's never compromise. He is always firm, he's loving, he's compassionate, but he's not going to let us get away with tuning things down to our ease and our level. He's always going to hold us to the highest standard of all. And uh, so he went into the temple and pulled out a, made a whip of ropes, it says, or cords, and uh, let the people know that they were not welcome there in God's house. And they weren't in the immediate temple building. If you've seen pictures of the Jewish temple, it's on a 30-acre platform. And the main temple was in the middle. And then there was an outer court and then a wider court, the court of the Gentiles, where anybody could be. And this is out in the court of the Gentiles. And what Jesus is saying is, you can do this downstairs in the streets. That's fine. There's plenty of room for commerce and trading and all these kinds of things. But when you do it here in the temple area, you're disrupting even the Gentile nations coming and learning about the God of Israel. And he didn't want any interference there with people connecting with God spiritually. Yes, they used animal sacrifices in that system. No pilgrims traveling distances, great distances for these festivals couldn't bring sheep and cattle and stuff with them. So it was perfectly legitimate for them to buy them in town, but they didn't need to be doing that in the temple. So Jesus was willing to upset the established order if necessary. And the line here that the disciples quote and remember about him is, zeal for my house, uh, zeal for my father's house will consume me. Jesus was not going to let things slide, but he was always going to be obedient to God's word and the standards that God set up and his commands, which are very clear, and to uh, keep things perfect and in order. And this is kind of going back to the third command, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. This is a way of profaning God's name when you turn religion into a money-making racket, which is what the priests had done at that time. The priests got a cut of every animal sold. I mean, uh, of the profit of that. They probably got some of the meat as well, but the, that was uh, part of their actual compensation at that time. So Jesus was trying to make sure things stayed perfect and honorable to God. And so he was willing to let his zeal show because of that. So that's, that, that's two things to measure ourselves by. Are we equally zealous for the commands of God and keeping God's ways in the world uh, proper and enforced? And so uh, we, we can measure ourselves that way. Now, we have one other example of uh, Jesus seal and that's the communion celebration that we have before us this morning. If Jesus was zealous for God's house and God's word this is where we see that Jesus is zealous for you and on your behalf. This demonstrates what Jesus was willing to give for you and in fact for the whole world. This is where the price of the sins of the world was paid and wiped away with his death on the cross. Jesus gave everything Body, blood, life, comfort, divine status, uh, anything, power, authority, all the things that he had, he surrendered for your benefit and for mine and for the rest of humanity. 
And so we invite you to come and partake of this meal as a reminder of his sacrifice for you. He was zealous for you. Won't you be zealous for him in return? And that's where we wind up today. Just that simple question. Are you willing to be zealous for jealous in return? Are you willing to give him your time, your devotion, your energy, the passion of your heart as a sign of your dedication and gratitude to him? That's what he asks of you. He doesn't ask you to sacrifice your life on the cross or anything. He just wants your heart given in willing obedience to him in gratitude for his love, his grace, and mercy. That's the greatest gift you can give him because he has already given so much to you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. We ask that you feed us and nurture us now at this meal that we can be brought closer to you and to one another as we gather around your table and celebrate and partake of the sacraments that represent your body and blood, the sacrifice for our sins. We do this to remember you and all your love for us and for the whole world. Thank you for your blessings, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation as we prepare for communion is number 500.